greatest of right now. Wilder Fury 2, here we go. Does Wilder have a jab? No. Yeah. And he used the jab one time in that fight with Stefan. And that was it. You think, you know, his whole, his, whole, his whole thing is, his motto is, you got to be perfect for 12 rounds. Yes. Like, like that. Mm. So, so, so basically, that's why... And also, another question I wanted to ask you. Is it true that Deontay Wilder doesn't really hit the heavy bag and the speed bag and opts more for the traditional training of strength and conditioning? Is that true? That's not traditional. No. He boxed. He never hit the he, bag. He don't hit the bag. He don't, he don't hit the speed bag. Right? Wow. Wow. Wow, yeah, very but, interesting. Well, what I'm trying to say, Mark, could it have been like, even though... Um, first of all, he don't jump rope. He don't he jump don't rope. Bags, he don't hit These comments from Mark Breland have caused an influx of news, an influx of reactions, uploads, and this one is just mine. Mark Breland really said a mouthful. He was quoted as saying, if I box the guys that he boxed, I beat them. That's the bottom line. You say he had some good wins? A good win. Just that Luis Ortiz fight. That was it. Comes to parting ways with Deontay Wilder. Mark said, part of boxing, I guess. His career is done now, so I'm done and he's done. One thing you all say is, he's got a lot of power and that's all. Only got power and we'll see how far that takes him. That's all I'm going to say. In reference to Glovegate, Mark said, I doubt it very much. He's not going to beat Fury regardless. Either JD's is blind or... Because he was there. But to be honest, that's just how much he knows about boxing. Hell, he probably could have put a cast in and he wouldn't have known. In reference to Deontay Wilder's accusation that Mark Breland spiked his punch, so many people know me. My character speaks for itself. Spike the water? If you're looking at the tapes, someone else is giving him the water. Only foolish people come out with this stuff like that because it's crazy. Mark's not wrong here. Yeah. From the moment news broke that Deontay Wilder was accusing Mark Breland of foul play, accusing Mark Breland of being in cahoots with Team Fury, poisoning him, spiking his water, there were several professional boxers, people in the sport of boxing, in the business of it, that came forward to vouch for Mark Breland. That, that kind of a proposition is preposterous. Raging Babe among them, she said, don't be mad at Mark Breland, be objective, be consistent. That man didn't deserve what came to him after that defeat. This man was a former Olympian, ex-fighter, and is respected by everyone. One of the good guys in boxing. And there aren't many of those left. You guys wanted my reaction to this. Here it is. Mark Breland's comments. They're not said in anger. They are not said in haste. It's taken quite a while for Mark Breland to let the proverbial cat out of the proverbial bag. Understand that Deontay Wilder accusing Mark Breland of spiking his punch, that was months ago. And when that news broke, you didn't see Mark Breland come out swinging. You didn't see Mark Breland firing on all cylinders and attacking the character of Deontay Wilder. In that way, what he's saying here today is not being said in haste. It's not even being said in anger. Not necessarily. If it were, we'd would have heard all these comments from Mark Breland a lot sooner. But it's taken months for Mark to clear the air. It's taken months for Mark to let the boxing community know how he feels about it, where he had every precedence to come out swinging against Deontay Wilder's accusations. Mark chose to take the high road. At first. He didn't address it at first. 
But after months and months of the same accusations, the same allegations lingering, Mark Breland has so decided to clear the air. Finally. And Mark is saying what we've been all thinking for months and for some for years. Walt is not a well-schooled boxer. How many times have you heard that the last couple of years? All he's got is a right hand. What? You just now realize this? What rock have you been living under? Mark Breland's tender, his comments, they only confirm what me and you were already thinking, that, you know, Wilder, he's just, he's not much of a boxer. And, and what Mark essentially did was add the why to the equation. Why is Wilder not much of a boxer? Well, it's because of his philosophy. The other guy's got to be perfect for the whole 12 rounds of a fight, whereas he's only got to be perfect for a second, a two second, or however the fucking mantra goes. It's for this reason that he doesn't train right way. conventionally. He doesn't skip rope, he doesn't do this, he doesn't do that, doesn't hit the double end bag, all this different stuff. This is how a boxer like Deontay Wilder becomes as limited as he is. I'll tell you what I think, I'll tell you what I think. In so many words, what I took away from Mark Breland's comments... What I got. ...is that Deontay Wilder is not a good student. Uh, how could he be? How could he have been a good student when he had access to Mark Breland and derived no knowledge from this ex-Olympic gold medalist and former WBA welterweight champion. How could Deontay Wilder have been a good student when you have access to a Mark Breland, someone who in many ways is a smaller version, was a smaller version of yourself? You know, Mark Breland was very statuesque for his weight, welterweight. 6'2". In many ways, Mark Breland had the same physical dimensions that Deontay Wilder has. You know, he was a very lanky guy, very long rangy guy, strong puncher, like Deontay Wilder is a strong puncher. But Mark was a hell of a boxer, whereas Deontay Wilder was not. not. And Deontay has had access to Mark Breland all this time and soaked up absolutely nothing, no knowledge Nada. from this fighter. How's that possible? I'll tell you how it's possible. Deontay Wilder's not a good student. These comments that Mark made are likely passing thoughts that he had while he was still with Deontay Wilder. Things that crossed his mind but he wouldn't say because he's on that guy's team. He has a responsibility to, to that guy, to be in that guy's corner. But these sound a lot like thoughts that Mark was harboring while he was still on the Deontay Wilder side. Thanks. All time. Well, obviously, he's at liberty to say these things now where you wouldn't have heard him say that before because he was Team Wilder before, whereas here today, he's no longer on that team. Not anymore. It'd be very easy to interpret Mark's comments as the comments of a jilted trainer who was let go. But need I remind you that Mark didn't rush to criticize Deontay Wilder right away. When Wilder said what he said all those months ago about him being drugged and suspecting Mark of having been the culprit, Mark didn't rush to get into a verbal exchange with this guy. He didn't rush to criticize him or, or his technique or the lack thereof. No, Mark chose to take the high road. And that's why here today I know that he's not speaking in anger, not necessarily, at least not speaking in haste. It's not as simple as saying that this is a jilted trainer who feels jilted for being let go, because if he felt that way, we would have heard this stuff a long time ago, but we're just now hearing it from Mark, aren't we? These are likely things that Mark was thinking the whole time that he was on Team Wilder. But because these accusations and allegations won't go away, because they're still lingering, well, Mark's got to address it. And he's at liberty to do so because, in so many words, what Deontay Wilder is accusing him of doing is, is pretty much a felony. You're saying the guy slipped your mickey. Some people might be surprised that Mark Breland didn't so decide to defend himself sooner. Do you remember when Sergei Kovalev first parted ways with John David Jackson? Sergei Kovalev immediately rushed to criticize John, and John immediately rushed to criticize Kovalev. To respond. Whatever was said between them was said in anger and was said in haste. Whereas Mark, Mark didn't react right away to what Wilder said. He tried to take the high road, but these allegations, they won't go away. So that puts Mark in a situation where he's got to be honest about everything and he's got to defend himself. Because that is what he's doing. I think between the shits and giggles we all get out of Glovegate, that's what gets lost in translation, that this is a very serious accusation that Wilder is levying against Mark. You're accusing him of spiking your water. It's only right that Mark Breland lash out and defend himself. I don't think the relationship was ever good between them. That's because a trainer, a good trainer, 
He'll give you that swift kick in the ass when he needs to give you that kick in the ass. And, and that's not what Wilder's looking for. Nope. Wilder's looking for a yes man. Like JD's. Not looking for somebody who's going to give him that kick in the ass when he needs that kick in the ass. You can't be a good trainer and a yes man at the same time. Part of being a good trainer is being honest with your fighter. Being honest about what that fighter needs. Oh. I don't think the relationship was ever good between these two guys. And perhaps that's why Deontay Wilder, in his own mind, rushed to suspect Mark, of all people, of foul play. He was looking for someone to blame. So the first person he blamed was the guy he already doesn't get along with. The guy that, underneath it all, he doesn't like. And I think that that feeling, I think it was mutual. Doesn't help that Mark threw the towel. That would effectively make Mark Breland the ultimate scapegoat. Oh, he costed you the fight. The fight that you were clearly losing. The fight that could have costed you more than your WBC title. It's Mark's fucking fault that all of that happened the way that it did. It is rather strange that, you know, according to Deontay Wilder, at some point when Tyson Fury's hands were wrapped, the other guys, Team Fury, put something in there. In that situation, it wouldn't be Mark Breland that was culpable. It would have been JD's, as it would have been him. They pulled a fast one on. That something got past him. And yet, J.D.'s here today, he's still got a job. You know, Wilder didn't fire him. He fired Mark Breland. That's because, well, J.D.'s is everything Wilder wants him to be. He's a yes man. Whereas him and Mark, I don't think they ever really got along. I don't think they ever really had that much of a rapport. I could be wrong. Maybe at some point, the relationship changed. But I reiterate, J.D.'s has still got a job. Mark doesn't. Mark is just saying what we were all thinking. And it's because he doesn't have to hold it back anymore. He can be completely honest about what kind of fighter Deontay Wilder really is and what kind of fighter, what kind of person he isn't. In other, more encouraging heavyweight news per tweet from Michael Benson, Joe Joyce on Oleksandr Yusik fight. It's looking like April. Negotiations seem to be going well. Looks like the fight is lining up nicely and it's almost confirmed. Joe Joyce has been quite vocal, quite adamant about wanting this second engagement with Oleksandr. This rematch. I don't see the energy being mutual on the Usyk side of things. From where I'm sitting, I don't think that the Usyk people want this fight as bad as Joe does. And, and why would they? You know, Usyk's the guy that walked away with the win, with the W in that semi-pro fight all those years ago in the World Series of Boxing. He's not going to want it as bad as Joe does. Could be that. Could be the language barrier. I mean, Usyk only speaks but so much English. Perhaps he has expressed something that people here in this part of the world haven't come across because he said it in Ukrainian. I don't know. But the look of it really is that if anybody's excited about this fight, it really is Joe Joyce. It really is Sam Jones. It's the weirdest thing. You know, I I've talked about the fight a couple of times already that this ain't no semi-pro fight. We're talking about a 12-round professional boxing match here and, and how that differs from a five-round semi-pro fight. I think about Usyk, how he's been over the years. There are those out there who feel that Usyk's body is finally starting to break down. All those years spent in the amateur ranks, his excellent run as a cruiserweight. Everything he did in that division and for that division, as I don't recall cruiserweights ever getting the same kind of attention that they're currently getting. They were never all that much talked about. You know, the cruiserweight division was often treated as the heavyweight division's uglier sister. Ew. I mean, even when Holyfield was there, it, it was never really viewed as a glamour weight. When Holyfield was there and David Hay, you know, it, it, it was just never talked about all that much. Here today, the cruiserweights really do get a little bit more shine. I think that uh, guys like Usyk, they're part of that. Uh, the Solon brothers and what they did. They're good. World Boxing Super Series, both seasons. I think that helped. Because I reiterate, I don't re recall cruiserweights being talked about this much in previous areas of boxing. Better still, Usyk's not a cruiserweight anymore. And it's for this reason that some people feel... That, you know, the heavyweight division, you know, he might be biting off more than he could chew up there. At minimum, what you have to say is that the circumstances are different. If he does fight Joe Joyce in 2021 this time around, it's not a five-round semi-pro fight. He is older. He will have amassed wear and tear over the years. Everybody does. The strangest thing about this fight that could be going down as soon as April. The strangest thing about it, at least for me, 
is what a win would communicate and how at least from where I'm sitting, it would communicate different things for either guy. If Usyk manages to beat Joe, I think that Usyk, Comparatively. all things considered, would be about as ready as he's going to be to take on the winner of Fury versus Joshua. That if he can beat Joe, again, given everything he's done as a cruiserweight and his brief stint as a heavyweight, he's as ready as he's gonna be after that if he can beat Joe again in a 12-round fight. Whereas with Joe, I do feel a little different. I do feel that even though Joe is riding high from having beaten Daniel Dubois, and if he were to beat Oleksandr Usyk, if he managed to avenge the loss, that doesn't necessarily communicate to me that he's ready for the winner of Joshua versus Fury. I know it sounds strange, but you really have to think about it. Daniel Dubois, you know, Joe Joyce, big win for Joe. I didn't think he was going to win that fight. I don't know if you guys did, but I didn't. And he proved me wrong. He did. Credit to him. But Daniel doesn't come from the same amateur background as Joe. He doesn't come from the same amateur background as Usyk. Essentially, Daniel was a greenhorn. And, and Joe beat him, but that doesn't change that Daniel was a greenhorn. He was. He doesn't come from the same kind of background that Joe does and several other fighters. As a professional, you know, Daniel wasn't all that proven either. That was his opportunity to prove himself. So Joe beats that guy, you know. It's in the history books. If he beats Usyk... What does that really mean? You know, what? Beating Usyk means you're ready for Tyson Fury? Is that it? Beating Usyk means you're ready for Anthony Joshua. Is that what that means? Because you have to remember, if Joe wins this fight, good chance he's going to get the winner of Joshua versus Fury. It is a question of when, but not a question of if. He'll get the winner. Perhaps not right away, as there is a high probability that Joshua versus Fury is billed as a two-fight engagement. The winner of this fight is going to have to wait. Wait for that two-fight engagement to be over if that's how the cookie crumbles but you really got to think about it you beat a greenhorn in daniel dubois good win still a very good win and you beat Usyk, who hasn't proven very much as a heavyweight all things considered i mean not really does that succession of fights prepare you for tyson fury does it prepare you for anthony joshua i mean i think it helps it does strengthen joe joyce's body of work his resume in a manner of speaking those would be some quality wins in succession if joe can avenge the loss to Usyk. but joe avenging the loss to Usyk doesn't necessarily communicate at least not to me that he's ready for the winner of that fight it's a different kettle of fish man neither of those two guys are cruiserweights that moved up to heavyweight looking to make their bones in this division tyson fury and anthony joshua are career heavyweights that bring different characteristics to the table characteristics that Usyk doesn't necessarily possess at least not all of them. It's getting interesting.